Good to see you, Austin Ridge. I don't know about you, that was the best 20 minutes of my week just now. Thank you guys for serving us so well. <clears throat> my name's Blake White. I am the campus pastor of our Dripping Springs campus. Do you guys know we're starting a campus in Dripping Springs? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, it's good to, good to be with you. I actually haven't preached here in quite a while, so I'm excited about opening the Word with you. If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. We're in between series. We just finished Collision. Next week we start the book of Judges, and this morning we're going to take a look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to see ordinary people equipped with extraordinary power. Just regular guys and gals with the same spirit as us, the same gospel as us, and they are sharing the gospel, they're giving, they are suffering, they are praying for the spread of the gospel and the glory of Christ, and this is what we see all through the book of Acts. Let's read together Acts chapter 2, verse 41 to 47. Acts 2, 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for this picture of what you want us to be. And so we ask that through your word, by your spirit, you would help us to be just that. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So where are we at in the storyline of Scripture with the book of Acts? Well, we know that Jesus has been crucified for sinners. He's been raised from the dead. He's been exalted to the right hand of God. He's been given all authority. And now in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, before this passage we read, he poured out the Spirit. And so this is in fulfillment of what the prophets talked about. The day of fulfillment has come here. The new covenant has been initiated. What's fascinating is we see here with the initiation or the start of the beginning of the new covenant, you have 3,000 people being saved. And what's fascinating is way back in the book of Exodus, when the old covenant was being given, may you remember there were 3,000 people who died in judgment. You remember that? God had saved his people. He had brought Israel out of Egypt But he had yet to bring Egypt out of Israel. They were still idolaters. And so you remember what they did? They took all their gold jewelry, they built a calf, and they give that calf credit for bringing them out of Egypt. And in judgment, in Exodus 32, 3,000 people die in judgment. And here in the New Covenant, you have 3,000 people being given new life. God's doing a new thing, you see. The new covenant is here, and we see a picture of what the people of this new covenant should look like, the new humanity. So we see what they were devoted to in Acts chapter 2, and I want us to take a look. At first, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Look again at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they were committed to learning about God. They were committed to it. This is, the apostles' teaching is what we find in the New Testament. They were devoted to it. They were committed to being a people of the book. To know God is to know Scripture because Scripture is where God has revealed himself. And the early church was devoted to it. And this is important for a whole host of reasons. One of the reasons I think it's very important is that doctrine, the apostles' doctrine, fuels devotion. The more we understand God, the character of God, the person of Christ, the work of Christ, the more it will help us as we adore him. Understanding fuels the right kind of adoration. Doctrine fuels our devotion so we can praise him with more intelligence, understanding who he is. And you all get this, right? Let's say my wife, Alicia, comes in and I say, babe, you got the most beautiful blonde hair I've ever seen. 
You might think, man, she'd be flattered. She might be flattered if she had blonde hair. She doesn't. So my ill-informed praise doesn't exalt her. In fact, it insults her, right? The more we understand our God, the better we can adore Him, the better we can cherish Him, the better we can praise Him. So we ought to always be growing in our understanding of God. And the way we do that is through the apostles' teaching. The early church was committed to it. Committed to understanding God better, understanding His person and Jesus and His plan, all found in Scripture. This is why we at the Ridge are committed to preaching the way we preach. If you've been here for a while, you notice that we typically preach verse by verse, book by book through the Bible. It's known as expositional preaching is the fancy term. And all it means is that the point of the sermon is the point of the passage. So if you're searching for a church, let me just encourage you, put some roots down here. You can trust us because we're going to tell you what God has said. You're not going to find a whole lot of stories and opinions and hobby horses here at the Ridge. You're going to find the Word of God unpacked. I mean, for goodness sakes, we're doing judges next week. Who does that? people who believe it's the Word of God. That's who does it. <laughs> so if it's not the Ridge, let me encourage you, find a place that preaches like this, preaches from the text of Scripture. It's important. It's important for several reasons I want to share with you. Number one, it shows that a preacher really believes all of Scripture. Again, most pe- churches will say that. Most pastors will say that. But the proof is in the pudding. How do they handle the Word of God on Sunday mornings? It becomes really clear. And here, listen, this is what you're going to get. Even judge is in all its glory. So it shows us that we really do believe all of this is the Word of God. Second thing is it allows God to set the agenda, not the preacher. It keeps the preacher from hobby horses because this is what we're going to open up. Third thing, it lets the authority of what I say or what Brad or Mark says, it lets our authority of what, the, what, the authority of what we say rest on the text not on my own authority. That's especially important for a 33-year-old preacher like me. You don't want to hear my opinions. You want to hear what God has said. The fourth reason is that it teaches people how to be good Bible readers. So you ought to come away and be able to read Acts 2 later this afternoon in in a better way and see the depth of it. It helps you just be better Bible readers. So devoted to the apostles' teaching. We are as a church, so when you come here, come ready. Come ready to hear the word. But being devoted to the apostles' teaching is a whole lot more than right here. You've got to be in it. You've got to be in this thing daily. Being devoted to the teaching of the apostles is more than being devoted to a church building that's devoted to the apostles' teaching. So if your only exposure to the Word is here, you're missing out. God has more in store. Here, at this 30 minutes, that's not devotion. So are we growing in this? Do we read it daily? Are we trying to grasp the big picture of it and how it all fits together and points to Jesus? Listen, God has ordained that the way we as Christians grow is through the Word. If you're you're frustrated, disappointed in your growth, get in the Word. And there's a real sense in which our own spiritual growth is dependent upon us because He's given us the means. So let's commit to this. I love how 1 Peter puts it. He says that we ought to long for this book, long for the milk, so that by it... By the word we may grow. This is how it works, friends. Let me talk to the men here for just a minute. Because men, if you're married especially, Ephesians 5, several passages all over the New Testament call you the, the head of the home. You're called to be the spiritual leader of your home as a man. If I were to ask your wife, tell me about the relationship of your husband and the word of God. Would she say devoted? Or would she say non-existent? Let's grow, man. Let's grow. Let's step up our game and let's lead. And the way we lead is through the word. Let's grow in our devotion. The first Christians were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Second thing they were devoted to, again in verse 42, is fellowship. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Fellowship is just sharing life together. And sharing stuff together. They were committed to the sharing of life and the sharing of resources. Look at verse 46 of Acts 2. It says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Day by day, they were committed to intentional Christian relationships. For too many of us, the extent of our Christian community is a handshake. Maybe a smile. If you're a dude, it might be a head nod. What's up? community. No. No. There's a whole lot more to it than a brief 
handshake on Sunday morning. And listen, I know it can be inconvenient. I know it can be hard, as one has said, to dwell above with saints I love. Oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with saints I know, well, that's another story. I know it's hard, but listen, God uses community even when it's difficult, perhaps especially when it's difficult to shape us into his image. I love the title of a book by an author I love, and it's called Relationships, A Mess Worth Making. It's messy. It's hard. It's inconvenient. And that's one of the main ways that God sanctifies us, the way he shapes us into Christ. So we need to be devoted to fellowship, and to be devoted to fellowship is more than just saying, yeah, I love the church. It's to be devoted to the habits of fellowship, which again, it's not easy. It's courage, it's commitment, it's humility, it's compassion, it's forgiveness. But we've got to understand there are no Lone Ranger Christians. A solitary faith is not a Christian faith. God has not left us with that option. And it's just interesting, the language of the New Testament. Paul, I love Paul, I'm real familiar with his writing, so I tend to lean on him more. He says the word, our Lord, the phrase, our Lord, 53 times. You know how many times he says, my Lord? Once. Because this is a community thing. Community is vital. I love the way one ancient theologian put it. uh, Cyprian of Carthage said, you can't have God as father if you don't have the church as your mother. Because they go in hand in hand. To be a lover of Christ is to be a lover of his body, right? Christ is the head of the church, his body. There is no decapitated discipleship. If we claim to love the head, the body comes with it. We've got to be moving into community, loving the church, devoted to it. The early church did this. They did life together, and they knew the needs of one another. They got that deep, and then they met them. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, this isn't communism. This is voluntary. People kept their homes, but they didn't see them as their homes. All that they had was for the benefit of others in the kingdom of Christ. They were committed to this. I was reading Ephesians this week, and in chapter 4, this phrase stuck out at me that I probably read many times, but it just hit me, and it's talking about Paul's just giving, giving uh, exhortations on how to live. And he says, hey, if you used to be a thief, you've come to Christ, you've learned Christ, you don't steal anymore. Instead, you work. You do honest work, and then he says, so that you may have something to share with those who are in need. Brothers and sisters, one of the reasons we work is so that we will have something to share with our brothers and sisters in need. And again, we've got to know people, right? We've got to know them to know their need. And we've got to know people well enough to be, be open about sharing our need. These early Christians knew why they existed. They were blessed in order to be a blessing to others. In other words, they were family. You know, when you're reading your New Testament, you see this word over and over and over. You hear brothers, brothers, brothers. Actually, a better translation is brothers and sisters because the term means siblings. The term means from the same womb. And you hear it 139 times. And again, in Paul's writings, brothers, 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 brothers. And we just read over it, right, because it becomes familiar. But we ought to stop. What he's saying is the church is our family. We are of the same family. We are from the same womb. We are siblings. And family knows one another, and family takes care of one another. These people valued people over property. They were committed to fellowship, the sharing of life and the sharing of stuff. Third thing, they were committed to the breaking of bread. Look again at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. Now, some think this refers to the Lord's Supper. No doubt that probably happened on occasion, but look again at verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So Luke says they're doing this day by day and in their homes. The first Christians were known for their hospitality. They were eating together all the time. And God has designed us so that something special happens when we break bread together. You know, your dinner table is the most sacred spot in your house. And there's something about hanging out with family and Christian family over a meal. Did you notice if you're reading carefully, there's an and between every one of these things except fellowship 
and breaking of bread. Because the two go hand in hand. Let's read it again and notice that. They devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So you have and, and, then you have fellowship to. They were devoted to fellowship and they were devoted to the breaking of bread. There's no and there. I think a better translation might be they were devoted to fellowship in the breaking of bread because that's where it really happens. Deep fellowship happens in the breaking of bread. Are we devoted to this? If you have a dinner table, you have a platform for ministry. The early church ate together all the time. Any Baptists in here? I used to be one. Baptists love to eat. They've got this right. I've got two words for you. Pot luck. We went to a church one time where it had a very strong view of God's sovereignty, and so we don't believe in luck, right? We believe in providence, so we called them pot providence. <laughs> pot providence, they had it right. We should be eating together all the time, and larger scales, smaller scales, because this is where fellowship happens. And here's the thing about eating together. You're already doing it, right? Most of us probably have 21 meals a day. Why not redeem that rhythm? We're already going to be doing it. We're already going to be spending anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half on it. Why not invite a Christian brother or sister in, or even better, an unbelieving neighbor in, and redeem that ordinary rhythm that you're already doing? I'm not asking you to add to your schedule. I'm just asking you to be intentional with it, as the early church was. They were devoted to the breaking of bread together. Another thing, prayer. Look at verse 42 again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. See, they believed God heard them, and they believed God had the power to act. They believed in the power of prayer. And if you look at the book of Acts, the way they're praying, they're praying God-centered prayers. Have you ever noticed the way the authors of Scripture pray, or the way it's recorded as they pray? They pray God-centered prayers. Most of our prayers are more like an organ recital. Or we just recite off a lot of organs. You know, we pray for Bertha's bladder, Sister Helen's hip, Brother John's joints. We just pray for the physical things, Aunt Flossie's fingers. You don't see that kind of stuff in the Bible, though. In fact, there may be one time in the whole New Testament where physical things are prayed for. That's striking to me. I think we've got the emphasis wrong. In the New Testament, they're praying for spiritual growth for fruit. They're praying for the spread and promotion of the gospel. I wonder, let's say God answered every one of your prayers for the last six months. Would we merely have a lot of physically healthy people? Physical health is good, but hey, let's be honest. Physical health sometimes is what keeps us dependent upon ourselves. It's sometimes the trials that we need to make us look up. So let's pray God-centered prayers like they did in the book of Acts in the early church. They were devoted. They prayed kingdom stuff. What else? Verse 43. They were devoted to demonstrating the kingdom. Verse 43. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, this looks a little different for us. The apostles were gifted in special ways that we're not. And one of the main reasons there was more, if we want to call them special signs, is because God was confirming his message. We could spend a lot of time on this. I just want to share two verses with you that show this. Listen to the Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed by, to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it, that is the message, by signs, wonders, and various miracles. They were to testify. They were to demonstrate. They were to confirm. Here's how Mark puts it at the end of his gospel. The disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied, accompanied it. So these signs and wonders were never meant to be the norm. They were special there through the apostles in order to confirm the message. And what they were doing is saying, hey, the, the, everything the prophets promised is here now. They were giving evidence that the inbreaking kingdom of God was at hand. They were witnessing to the dawn of the new age that Jesus ushered in. Now, this isn't to say miracles don't happen. Of course miracles happen. We believe that firmly at the ridge, but they don't happen in the same way or with the same regularity. So we demonstrate the kingdom, but we do it in different ways, right? We still do it. We're an outpost of the kingdom, and we show the watching world what it looks like when King Jesus comes to town. We show them what it means to be truly human, humans that are being ruled by Jesus and are being transformed by him. 
Anyone like movie trailers? I like movie trailers. Alicia doesn't like them. They give away all the good parts, according to her. But I like to watch a trailer before I'm going to see a movie. And what's a trailer trying to do? It is trying to show you the good parts to draw you in to come see the movie. That's what we are, friends, as the church. We're a trailer of the new creation. We're a preview of the new day. People who don't follow Jesus ought to look at us and smell a sense of the society to come. We are a foretaste of what the new earth will look like when God makes all things new. So we demonstrate the kingdom by our acts of love. So the apostles' teaching, fellowship, eating together, prayer, and demonstrating the kingdom. And I think there's one word in this passage that is most important and most challenging to us, and that's the word devoted. They were devoted to these things. Better, they were devoted to King Jesus. And a life that is devoted to King Jesus looks like this. Again, a life that's devoted to the head is going to be very concerned about the body and about the mission of the head. They were devoted. 3,000 people joined the church. And did you notice the emphasis on all? Just look at 43 and 44. All came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together. We're talking about 3,000 people, all of them, all in. This is what we call every member ministry. They were devoted. They were preoccupied. They were persistent in paying attention to what matters most. They were single-minded. They had made Jesus and his body a priority, and I think us busy Austinites need to hear this most. They had to say no to a lot of things to say yes to this. They were preoccupied and paying attention to what matters most. They had to say no to a lot of things that are ultimately trivial to say yes to that which is ultimate. They were gripped by the Lord and they, they prioritized their life in light of him. They ordered their lives accordingly. They budgeted their resources. That's another sermon for another day. But they also budgeted their time with the kingdom of Christ in mind. For them, Jesus really was Lord. And this is all for us, friends. This is all normative. These things weren't just for back then. They weren't super Christians, right? This is God's desire for all Christians at all times. Now, I want to ask you a question. Out of all we've talked about, how much of what we've talked about happens here on a Sunday morning? Apostles teaching? Yeah, we're going to do that well at the Ridge. But one can hardly call 30 minutes devotion. Fellowship. The sharing of life and resources. Again, maybe a handshake, maybe a head nod. You might visit a little bit in the lobby before you get trampled. It's like Black Friday in Walmart every Sunday in the lobby. You just better duck and go. Not devotion to fellowship. What about breaking a bread together? Not really. What about prayers? One of the leaders may pray for 90 seconds. Is that devotion to praying together? No. It's not. What about demonstrating the kingdom? There's not much we can do in there. And even if we did do all that in here, it can't be called devotion. Devotion is not Sunday. Devotion is every day. And listen, friends, God had more in mind for his bride, the church, when he sent his son to save her by dying for her than merely an hour a week. Now, don't mishear me. I'm glad you're here. We want you to come back next week. Sundays are important. They are vital, but for New Testament Christianity, they're vital but supplemental. We need to move from Sunday only to an everyday mindset. Again, I love the way Brad used the analogy of Sundays as a huddle. Sundays are a huddle. Now, I'm not a, I didn't play football in high school. I know that probably shocks you. You're probably thinking clearly defensive linebacker with this thick physique. Uh, and I'm from West Texas where football is king. Mark can amen that. Football is king, but my school didn't even have football. We were 2A. We were a decent size. So it was weird because in West Texas, you've got family, maybe football. We'll say family, football, God, guns, dirt in that order. That's what we do in West Texas, but we didn't have football, so it was kind of strange. But I get the huddle. I understand what a huddle's about, right? The huddle is this brief moment where you get together, typically led by the quarterback, 
And it's this brief time of, of celebration, motivation, strategy. And then you get back in the game, right? Wouldn't it be really weird if we saw the huddle as an end instead of a means to an end? Like if there was this player that was just really excited, didn't care about the game of football, just really excited about the huddle. Like, man, I just can't wait to just be with those dudes in that little huddle. I might be a little bit concerned. Or what about a team? A team that all they did was huddle. They only huddled. They would get smashed, right? No, the point of a huddle is to get in the game. And friends, Sunday is a huddle. And we need it. We need this huddle. We need to come together. We get recalibrated. We get instructed. We get motivated. We get inspired. We get challenged. We get trained. And then we get back in the game. Sunday's the huddle. Every day is the game. And friends, you can't really be devoted to these things if you're not in a life group at Austin Ridge. Especially in a large church, it's the smaller setting where you share life where you dig deeper into the apostles' teaching, where you have that intimate fellowship, where you have breaking of bread together on occasion, you have serving your neighborhood, receiving care, having needs met. All that happens primarily through groups. So Sunday is fantastic, but it's the gravy. It's the gravy of the Christian life. The meat and potatoes comes through life groups. Life groups are the engine for our community, for our discipleship. So if you're not in one, I want you to know that you're missing out personally, but you're missing out on what the Lord has for you. And I want you to prayerfully consider making that your next step, joining a life group. Any Dripping Springs people in the house this morning? All right, Dripping Springs, let me talk to you for a moment. If you plan to make Dripping Springs your campus, I want to invite you. I've sent you a couple emails, but tonight at 530 We're having a gathering for people that are either currently leading a life group in Dripping Springs or have ever even thought about leading a life group in Dripping Springs. We want you to come tonight. So come tonight, 5.30 to 7. We're just going to do a little bit of vision casting, the why of groups, the what of groups, who do we want to lead, what are some expectations, any other questions you have. We're providing a meal, providing child care. So we want you to sign up. As you leave, you can go outside the doors, right to the left, sign up so we can expect you on food and child care. You're probably going to get wet. You won't melt. It's all good. Come, hang out. It's going to be fun. We're expecting about 60 60 or more, so it's going to be a good time. So dripping people, that's for you tonight. We'd love to see you here. Southwest people, people that Southwest is your home, you're staying here, you're sending us away, I want to invite you. Same thing. Go out these doors to your left. Greg will be over there. Greg Hill is having a QA and a again, covering groups and new groups and any questions you might have, the what, when, how, why, and it's going to be May 1st. Sunday at 11 a.m. in the conference room upstairs. And again, sign up outside and we'll get you covered. Doesn't commit you to anything. Drip people tonight, if you just want a free meal, come. If you've ever even thought about it, come. Come tonight. This is frontline, top-level leadership at the Ridge, and I'm excited. I'm excited for some of you who are going to take this step because the Lord's going to use you for one, but you, the leader, are going to grow in ways you've never grown before because you're going from sitting on the premises to standing on the promises, and you're going to be stretched and pushed and moved, and God's going to get the glory. So the early church devoted to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, eating, praying, and demonstrating what the kingdom looks like. Now I want us to see what the early church was characterized by, and the first thing is glad hearts. Look at verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were glad. Christians ought to be the gladdest people in the world. I hate it when I grumble. Anyone else grumble? Just me? Pharisees? Well, I grumble. I grumble. (laughs) And it's so frustrating because I have to remind myself, I, here's, what I, here's what I'm owed. I am owed eternal condemnation right now. That is the only thing I have earned. That's what I deserve right now. I do not deserve to take another breath, and yet I'm alive. I'm breathing. My sins have been forgiven, past, present, future. The tomb is empty The enemy is overcome. Evil has been defeated on my behalf. The right man is at the throne. Our future is secure. The best is yet to come. And I'm grumbling about what? (laughs) Glad hearts. When Jesus is in his proper perspective, our hearts are to be glad 
regardless of external circumstances because he doesn't change. So they're characterized by gladness. They're characterized by generosity. Glad and generous hearts. Giving hearts. Flip over a couple pages to Acts chapter 4. Verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So again, they valued people over property. They were generous. They were characterized by generosity. They were also characterized by praise. Look at verse 47. Praising God. Praising God. They worship together in the temple, and again, that's what we do. We gather and we sing songs to the Lord. You ever thought about it? Singing is sort of unique. You don't find congregational singing in mosques. Why do we sing? We sing because we're happy. We sing because we're glad. We sing because we're free. So we praise the Lord. They're characterized by praise. They're also characterized by multiplication. Look again at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Healthy churches multiply. Isn't it awesome? The Ridge joined with Southwest Hills two years ago or so, and we're already talking about multiplying. That's amazing. We need to celebrate that. And we're already thinking, what's next? This is the way we do it. Healthy churches multiply. And the reason that's the case, because God is a missionary God. God's on a mission. The church doesn't have a mission. God has a mission. And he has a church for that mission. Jesus sends us, right? God sends the Son, and Jesus sends the church with the Spirit and says, Jesus says in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Every one of you are a sent people called to represent the rule and reign of Jesus. And that's what we see all through Acts. I love how in Acts, it's almost as if Luke goes out of his way to show that it wasn't the professionals that were spreading the gospel. For example, in Acts 8, we have persecution starting to happen in the church. And you have all these Christians leaving the church in Jerusalem and going everywhere and starting new churches. That's what the book of Acts is. And I love that there's this little phrase in there that Luke includes in Acts 8 that says, Everyone left sharing the gospel except the apostles, except the professionals. It was ordinary people, regular people, just like us. No special training, no seminary degrees, just people passionate about Jesus, making it their intention to represent him in all they do. Then in the end of that chapter, you have Philip goes and makes the first international mission trip. Again, Philip was no apostle, just a normal dude. He was a layman. Then you have the the church at Antioch founded by one of these regular people. And the church of Antioch became this hub of planting churches all over the Roman Empire. We don't even know who started the church of Antioch. It says some brothers. Luke doesn't even tell us because we wouldn't have known who they were. I love the way one church historian puts it. Here's what he says. He says, nothing is more notable than the anonymity of these early missionaries. Luke, he's talking about the book of Acts, Luke does not turn aside to mention the name of a single one of these pioneers who laid the foundation. Few, if any, of the great churches were really founded by the apostles. Peter and Paul may have organized the church in Rome. They certainly did not found it. Churches planted all over the place by normal people. Our, the way our structure is, this can happen through life groups. Groups multiplying all over the place. I want to see a movement in Dripping Springs of life groups multiplying. That's the way we're going to reach the city of Dripping Springs. That's the way we're going to reach the city of Austin. Being focused on multiplication. They were committed to it. They were devoted to it. The reason they had this type of community that was so tight is because they had a common mission. They had a mutual aim. They had a primary purpose. The reason we have Acts 2 kind of community is because this community was on Acts 1 mission. Flip a page over and look at Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus says to his church, you will be witnesses. Not you'll go witness on occasion. You'll be witnesses. This is who we are. This is our identity. Acts 2 kind of community only comes when we're on mission together. I know a lot of you are in groups and have been part of groups. And you know when they become static and stale is when they become ingrown. But when you stay on mission, you stay on route, you stay on point, you stay in community. How many of you have been on like a short-term mission trip, one or two weeks with people? Don't you go really deep with the people on that trip? It's a special season, and really nothing's the same. You always have a special relationship with the people on that trip, and you'll reminisce about it years later. Why is that? It's because you were on mission together the way God has designed his people to be. That kind of camaraderie, that kind of desperation, that kind of outward focus, that kind of intentionality should be the characterization of the people of God all the time, not just two or three weeks every two or three years. And notice how Luke highlights both the behavior of the church and the sovereignty of God. He says, the Lord added to their number. The Lord's the one who adds to the church. He's the one who draws people to himself. But it also says they gained favor with the people. I think the idea is that they had goodwill towards all the people. They were favorably disposed towards the people. They had a gracious attitude and demeanor that led to gracious actions. Of course, we know in Acts, all the people didn't believe what they believed, but they were still favorably disposed to them. What if it was a goal of yours to end your life group even if people know, even if no one comes to faith, make it your goal that the neighborhood where that, neighbor, that life group is hosting is really glad you're there. Even if they deny that Jesus is Lord, they're glad that you're meeting in their neighborhood because you throw the best parties and you serve the dog out of that neighborhood. And they're glad you're there, favorably disposed toward all the people. They were demonstrating the kingdom. They were bringing blessing to where they were. They knew they were blessed in order to be a blessing, and they multiplied. So what's your next step, friends? I want to encourage us to begin to grow in our devotion to all these things together. And again, I think the main way to do this is through life groups. So I want to ask you to pray, consider, act, join the mission for the glory of Christ and the spread of the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for this word. Thank you for this story in Acts. Thank you for the story we find ourselves in where we're here. We're no different. We're part of the new covenant. We have the forgiveness of sins. We have the gift of the Spirit. We have this powerful gospel. Lord, I pray that we would become like this. Ordinary people gripped by your grace, wrecked by the grace of Jesus and compelled to spend and be spent on others. Lord, we confess that many of us are far from devoted, and so we just ask that you would light us up for your glory. May Jesus become more and more central in our hearts, and all this stuff will overflow when he's where he needs to be. So keep him central, make him central. Help us to be a people devoted to what matters most. Pray this in the strong name of Jesus.